of authority so that uh, we could um, uh, impact political decisions, at least in one way, as we heard in the last session, there are several ways. So, um, so that's what we've hopefully done, started doing. We haven't finished it, we've started doing here. Uh, I got, and what I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the conversations that we've been having, well, in fact, conversations we had here, but also conversations that I've been having and others have been having with our partners in Northern Canada to talk about where, where we go from here with RESTA. Uh, a couple of things, first of all, I remind you all to sign the consent forms um, that we need the consent forms and there's an evaluation form I think in there as well which would be great for us to have you fill that out. Um, we also have, we will be putting the web and the videos uh, up on um, the web so if you haven't signed the consent form um, we would have to track you down to find out whether you agree to have your particular presentation or statement put up on the web. Um, so if you're okay with having it put on the web, then, um, uh, well, it's already been web streamed, of course, but uh, to have it on our YouTube, um, uh, our YouTube, um, is it a YouTube channel or a YouTube? Yeah, YouTube channel. YouTube channel, that's right. Uh, then please let us do that because it saves us time uh, tracking people down. Um, or if you don't want it on there, let us know as well. And we will put it up. Um, okay. Um, so um, there has been um, quite a bit of discussion about what, where, you know, where Resda's, where Resda has come from over the last little while. So if we look at, at, at what we've done so far over the first five years of this particular project, um, uh, what I've tried to do over the past few months is to look at all the things that we've done to try and answer the questions, have we answered these questions um, and can we put that sort of question to bed because we <coughs> answered that question and we just move on to sharing that information with people um, and move on to other questions. Uh, often um, we've never, I don't think there's any one question you can say we put to bed, um, but what we've done is that as we try to answer one question and we answer at least some of the aspects of that first question, other questions arise. Um, and, that, uh, and that's been fairly standard through a lot of the research that we've done. That once we start to look at the research and we start to, to look at the results of the research, we, there are more questions that arise. And so uh, I've gone through what we've done so far and so the things that I, I, I sort of gathered uh, this information from are the 14 gap analyses that we, um, that we wrote originally um, and that are up on our website. Um, the whatever results that we have so far from <laughs> the 22 research projects that are finished or underway uh, for RESTA right now. Um, of course, the six community workshops we had, and we have them in all the regions of the Canada, and we have over 350 participants, so they had a lot of things to say through, during those um, workshops. <coughs> in addition, we have over 120 uh, videos on YouTube uh, of northerners uh, talking about uh, ways, talking about the relationship between extractive industry, uh, extractive industry development, um, and northern communities. So we've looked at those. We have 30 reports available on the website from various sources that we've completed. We've done over 70 presentations um, over the five years. Um, most of these have been in northern communities, and during, when we do those presentations either myself or the researchers do those presentations, the PIs generally, um, we get feedback. Um, and so we've looked at that. Uh, we have over 50 refereed publications and often in those publications, people, you know, there, there's the end of the publication where people say what new questions or what questions remain to be answered. So we've looked at that. And then of course we have the wide, uh, a wide range of knowledge sharing tools uh, that we have that hasn't really sort of been the primary focus of those tools is not to 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 sort of answer research questions but still though the, the use of those knowledge tools and the importance that that our communities have told us uh, that we need to place on transferring and sharing that knowledge with um, with northern communities makes it an important thing to look at uh, in in sort of deciding where we go from here so we've looked at that as well 
Um, so, uh, and probably uh, individual one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with, um, with uh, our, our partners. <laughs> Some of our key partners have gone through changes in the, in the, in the past little while that it was important for us to talk to. There's a, um, a new chief of the CYFN, so we went and talked to the new chief of the CYFN. There's a new president of the Inuvial Region Corporation, so we went and talked to the new president of the Inuvial Region Corporation. So these are sort of things that we've we've uh, been doing over the last few months to try and figure out <coughs> what we should do from now. <laughs> My wife tells me that we should just finish this and then I should retire. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I wonder if she's right or not. Um, uh, but uh, I think there there is a, a genuine desire to continue that that RESDA has built together sort of networks and resources uh, that can be put to continually answer new questions. And I think there's a, a willingness, a general desire and willingness among our existing partners and potential new partners um, that we didn't even think about when we first started um, um, the, the uh, project. Partners like YesSab in the Yukon, the Yukon, YesSab stands for Kiri. Yukon Environmental and Socioeconomic Assessment Board. Assessment Board, there you go. Thank you, Kiri. Um, um, that, that, that sort of uh, lead us to, to continue. So, so generally what we've, and, and so the steering committee has talked about this, <coughs> and generally there's a consensus that we should move forward on developing a new partnership grant. We were an MCRI grant, so we have now, and we've consulted with SHRC, and SHRC is willing to uh, allow us to apply for uh, a partnership grant. Usually you can only get those grants once. So they've allowed us to do that, and so based on that, we started talking about, about what type of project, and we wanted to do something new, something that would allow us to continue some of the questions that we're working at, because we still haven't answered a lot of, uh, of the things uh, that we wanted to uh, in, in RESTA, but we wanted to sort of move on to a new question, and for some of us, it's going back to earlier questions. You know, some of these you may not know, but the, the basic team for RESDA came from an earlier project called the Social Economy Research Network for Northern Canada. And that project tried to look at new alternative um, economic development that can come through using what was we call the social economy, the, the, the nonprofit voluntary um, uh, cooperative sector uh, of the economy. And so that's something that people in, in the um, uh, in, in the steering committee and, and others involved with RESDA would, I think, would like us to go back to a certain extent. So we're developing what, uh, we don't know if we want to call it RESDA 2 or CERNICA 3, um, yeah. but um, we're developing a project that mixes uh, hopefully some of the, the elements of CERNICA and some of the elements of RESDA. And it's basically around the idea that RESDA was good for, for focusing on how to get the maximum benefit from extractive industries in a whole range of benefits. Now we're thinking that it's perhaps more, more interesting and, and more beneficial to the communities if we sort of focus that notion of benefit to talk more about benefits for a longer term renewable and sustainable economy. So sort of the tentative title for this is from non-renewable to renewable futures. And so the focus would be on how to transform the short-term benefits of, of extractive resource development into long-term renewable development, highlighting the role of the social economy. The other thing that we need to, 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 to recognize as well is that there's been a lot of interesting projects developed since RESDA developed and that we can sort of partner with to answer some of some of uh, the things that we should be doing with this type of research. And so Cherry's partnership grant and his links with the Global South are an important aspect and a, an asset that we can use uh, if he allows us to partner with him um, uh, to, uh, to develop that aspect, to use his network to develop that aspect of our work. And Brenda's uh, partnership on, on, on traditional knowledge and its use in terms of resource development is another area that we hope to sort of share. Things. So that's that's another uh, element. But basically, I sort of divided the research questions that I got out of, a, a lot of these are in the summaries that you have uh, that the researchers produced for, um, for this particular um, 
workshop. Um, other, others are from suggestions from, um, from the different organizations that I've talked to, partnership organizations. But basically, there's a desire to continue projects that look at the managing the impacts on northern communities. Is that the whole notion of social impacts, cumulative impacts, we started to look at it, but there's a whole list of other questions that arise once you answer one question about social impacts. And, and this, in fact, is, is probably the best um, example of, of why this is important in, is in um, the, the, uh, the work that Thierry's been doing in his gap analysis uh, that Thierry did on, on impacts, looking at impact, social impacts in Canada, in the Canadian North, his, his sort of ideas about all the lists of new, new impacts that need to be looked at and considered. So, and then food security. Is that a lot of the times that people are pointing to the problem of can you use the benefits to improve our food security? Uh, and that's one of, that's one, a, a key issue that we want to do. And, and linked to that, of course, is subsistence activities. Obviously, enhancing community well-being is, is a, a theme that is shared by almost all the research projects that, that we have. Building capacity, using um, the extractive resource development to build capacity in northern communities. And finally, and been mentioned several times here, looking at new innovative uh, ways to diversify local northern economies. So based on those five general themes, um, we, um, we have sort of research questions that, that I've sort of looked at. Now, I'm not asking people to, to, to sort of uh, think about all these in depth. What, this will be put up on our website and we'll ask people to look at these and think about these questions to see if these are the best questions um, that could be posed, see if there are questions that um, that we need to add to the list that I'll talk about here. I have 24 questions. See if these questions can be, or see if we, you, if you think that these questions don't need to be looked at. But this is the base that we're going to start the conversation about developing a partnership program. Obviously, the way that we've always done this in the past is that is that we would never. We need to to do this through our partners, and so we need to talk to our partners to decide what sort of, of policies, what sort of not policies, questions that they <coughs> they uh, want us to look at. So, in terms of um, very quickly managing impacts on northern communities, what are the major problems communities and, or and organizations in the north currently uh, that currently face regarding the assessment <coughs> of social impacts? Those whole this the. Um, the assessment boards in the north have, are dealing with a whole range of issues about uh, concerning social impacts. And so a project, perhaps in partnership with the assessment boards looking at this, would be important. Health. Um, you know, the, a big point that we didn't really pay as much attention to at the beginning in RESDA uh, was the impact of, of extractors on health. Uh, and Jen, of course, Jen Jones is, is working on this now. Um, but this is an issue that, that I think we would like to, to sort of improve on. Uh, indicators work is still an issue and still of importance and so we'd like to continue that I think and it's certainly IRC and others are, 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 are very much concerned and continue to be concerned about that. Uh, the concerns shared by women into assessments and understanding impacts uh, and these impacts uh, more uh, more emphasis should be given uh, should be given to impacts that concern poverty sharing and food security. So that's generally the five food security and substance activities. And once again, is how can you use uh, the short-term benefits of extractive industries to help increase food security uh, in northern communities? Um, so one of the questions is, one of the best examples of extractive resource development being used to support subsistence activities. You know, we had the, uh, recently before the American Congress, we had the, uh, uh, the mayor of the North Slope Borough going forward in front of um, the Senate saying, if you put restrictions on oil and gas development in the North Slope Borough, it will kill our subsistence activities and we will die as a people. Um, and uh, that's a sort of example of, uh, well, some communities at least think that they're, that these uh, activities support subsistence activities. In other areas, um, they are uh, negatively impact subsistence activities. So to look at and see what's possible in terms of what's the best uh, case analysis in terms of extractive resource development used to support subsistence activities. 
What are the best ways for subsistence foods to be distributed in communities experiencing extractive uh, development? Important for food security when extractive, when a mine comes up. Comes up. How can we monitor the best, uh, the barriers, continue to monitor the barriers to subsistence activities when mining or oil and gas development occurs? What are the best examples of food security and food distribution uh, being enhanced by extractive resource development? What are the best examples when mining or, or oil and gas come about? How, do, how does that, you know, what are examples of that being used to enhance uh, food security? Enhancing community well-being. What are the best ways of integrating indigenous worldviews into decision making about resource development? And once again, this is an area that we would lean heavily on, um, on tracking change. Um, we would partner with tracking change on, on this, these types of decisions. How do communities feel about their, how, about their current role in decision making? You know, it's one thing that when we're talking to the communities, it's one thing, it's, and when we always say it's good news that now communities have a say in, um, in the decisions in extractive resource development. You know, they can, um, they, they can have their say through, uh, through the uh, environmental impact uh, uh, assessment process, through IBA negotiations, through monitoring. But at the same time, we've seen in research uh, by people um, uh, linked to RESTA um, that, um, that often communities feel that having the right to do so and having the ability to have input are two different things. And so we need to look at that. Um, what are the best ways for communities to distribute revenues for resource development? We tried, we were looking at that now. People have suggested they'd like us to continue to look at that in, in the future as well. Uh, what are the best models of community sovereign wealth funds for communities to use? We started that with the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the project that Melanie uh, talked about, but uh, communities think that we need to continue this sort of discussion, this type of research. How can we improve the role of women in resource de uh, development decision making? And this is, a, this is an issue that several of the, uh, of the researchers, Kiri and others, have been working on. Um, and so, um, um, and Suzanne, and so this is sort of uh, an issue that I think people would like to continue to look at. Building capacity. You know, how can you use, this is one of the big things that communities say, well, you know, uh, yesterday the Red Dog Mine was mentioned, and it's amazing how many people know that in the five communities surrounding the Red Dog Mine, the high school graduation rates are like 75%, which of course are graduation rates that we don't see in the Canadian North. And so, and many people seem to think that that need, must be linked somehow to the Red Dog Mine. So the whole notion of using sort of extractive resource development for building capacity in the community. It, it, it sort of, it does build capacity in the community. Often it builds capacity in, uh, by building, by uh, building networks in opposition to uh, a lot of the things, which is a good thing as well for these particular communities. And so, but, but also the communities want to know if it's possible to use these developments to help build capacity. So what are the best tra training forms for long-term sustainability? that come out of extractive resource development. Uh, you know, Gerdy and Sousa's work on, on, uh, on work-life balance and FIFOs, that's something that people have said that they'd like to continue to look at. Uh, the impact of extractive development on mobility, that's not something that we looked at uh, in our particular project. Does, does extractive resource development increase or decrease mobility and what does that mean for the long-term sustainability or, or renewable future for these communities? Um, uh, how can extract and support business development and entrepreneurship? Um, you know, this is an area that once again, when we were Cernica, we tried to answer the, we, we dealt with the questions of using nonprofit, cooperative, volunteer organizations to help to build um, uh, business development and, and entrepreneurship in a uniquely northern way. And so this is something that I think we'd like to continue. It's been mentioned by several people. Uh, how can we look at, at, at um, at this question. Dealing with closure, it was mentioned yesterday, you know, what are the, what's the best way that, you know, you have extractive industry development, it's gonna shut down. What's the best way of ensuring uh, when it shuts down, it, it doesn't devastate the community. Uh, what are the best employment arrangements that you can have uh, in communities? What are the ones that ensure that the employment benefits from uh, extractive industries are, 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 are utilized to the fullest extent by communities. 
are IBAs working? This is a, 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 a sort of comes from the research that, that Ben and his team are doing. Do they improve the situation or, as he says, perpetuate past problems? How can insure, you sure insured communities can adequately contribute to the negotiation of IBAs? This is, this, you heard Ben talk about this yesterday. Um, and then finally, diversifying local economies. Um, and, and that's the idea is, is you don't want to become dependent on a, a, a short term project such as a mine or something uh, that is, is not going to last a long time. So, but how do you use that to develop other types of activities, activities, economic activities that are more culturally appropriate and more sustainable? And part of this, and the other thing which I mentioned in many communities, and Anne talked about this on, uh, Anne talked about this yesterday, is the remediation activities and how to ensure that communities feel part of and of the remediation activities and are 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 not only content but get certain um, use remediation activities for the long-term sustainability of these communities. Um, infrastructure. Um, that's something that we did not look at in RESTA and that a lot of people have mentioned, is that uh, it's infrastructure which is often built for extractive resource development, but it doesn't have to be there only for extractive resource development. So what are some of the creative ways that we could look at using infrastructure development, even if it's initially to be installed for, um, for extractive resource development, uh, to ensure that that benefits the communities? We've all heard of examples such as um, the wind, the wind uh, power uh, at Raglan, um, something, things that, uh, that, that can be done to support the long term, uh, to use technologies. And, um, you know, the Yukon Research Center has been working on several uh, projects lately that look at using technologies to help communities in, in the north um, uh, diversify. Um, and how can we improve the models, the analytical models we use, such as the uh, Staples models, to better understand uh, where resource development leakages are occurring and where leakages could leakages could occur? So we talked, and in fact, uh, Alexander Palyasov took to, talked about that in his comments. Is, is that are there ways that are there current leakages that communities can look at to diversify their economy and turn a leakage into a leakage? Um, and that's a sort of a, an issue that, that, that organizations such as, as Arctic Co-ops have been in the past uh, able to, to use it. So it would probably be a project that we would seek to link to partner with Arctic Co-ops on those sort of projects. And so very briefly then, so that is the first, that's our first look. That's our first scan, if you will, of a research question for a potential new uh, partnership grant proposal. Um, and what we're now asking you is to, to get input from you uh, on those particular questions, um, to get um, input from you um, on what, uh, you know, those questions were very general, what the specific things that we should be looking at in terms of those research questions. If you think those research questions are not good questions, let us know. If you think that there are issues, and I'm sure there are issues that we've not included in these yet, we want to know those issues so we can talk to our partners and, and see whether they agree that they're important issues and that we can include those particular issues. On that, I will ask if there are any further questions. If you have, and you, if I, there are several people here you can talk to about uh, what you think should be uh, happening for any new research proposal. Uh, the steering committee, uh, we will be basically for the time being using the same steering committee going forward with this new Cernica 3, RESTA 2, we're not sure what it's, we'll, we'll call it yet. Uh, but remember that the members of the steering committee who make the decisions on the current RESTA project and will be making the decisions on the future one are Mary Ellen Thomas, Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Thomas, uh, Mary Nirlonyek, um, which is Mary, um, uh, Ron Sparks, put up your hand, Ron, Ron Sparks. Um, Charles Doré is not here anymore from Makavik, he's left. Um, uh, oh, Clint is here still, Clint Sawicki from the Yukon Research Center. Um, Dave Natcher, uh, who is a theme coordinator, and Brenda Parley, who is a theme coordinator. So talk to us. Um, I think, have I left everybody off? 
So one last thing I'd like to do is that, um, you know, one of the things that we've been, why, one of the main reasons why I think we've been so successful over the past 10 years is in the, the two projects that we've been involved in is, that, is it because we have, uh, as I say, uh, Cambridge Bay's own uh, Val Walker as our coordinator. So um, I would like... At